Okay, so today I'm going to be speaking with you all about healthy cognitive aging, focusing specifically on healthy aging. Um, and I'm going to be talking about some research that's interested me in the past couple years, that some of which have contributed to my ideas that led to my dissertation, and then also what ultimately led to my postdoctoral research um, on this topic. But here is just a general overview of what I hope to cover today. First, I want to start off with the demographic imperative for conducting aging research and give you just a brief sense of the growing aging population. I know that this doesn't necessarily um, stick within the parameters of learning and memory, but I think it's really important to put the importance of this research in context and why I would be interested in studying aging myself. Um, so just a reminder for the importance of looking at healthy aging in addition to pathological aging, which a lot of people might perceive as being a little bit more interesting. And then my plan is to cover some general age-related cognitive changes, so to give you um, a little bit of cognitive aging theory and just in general what happens to the aging brain. So touching upon what Mark had talked about, but then we'll delve a little bit deeper by talking about some specific neuronal changes with aging um, in the dopaminergic system and also between the striatum and the medial temporal lobes. And then I'm going to end by talking about some research um, that I've done myself that examines differences in learning between younger and older adults. And then finally, if we have time, I'll talk about some of my current and future directions looking at genetics and healthy aging and learning. And this will sort of capture everything that we've talked about in the lecture. So to begin, I just want to cover why would I study aging. There's a lot of negative stereotypes that are associated with aging, and those are depicted in this cartoon. And so you might be wondering why I would be interested in this topic. I know when I was in undergraduate myself, uh, one of my peers was really interested in studying aging, and it, it really was unclear to me why that would be the case. I just found working with kids to be a lot more interesting and really didn't see any appeal to working with older adults. Um, but so I study aging first selfishly because I'm aging, so this is something that I can look forward to in my life, hopefully. Um, but really we're all aging, and when I say that, I don't just mean that we're aging as individuals, we're aging as a world. So a recent report that came from the United Nations revealed that nearly 500 million people are currently 65 or older. And that total is expected to double just within the next 20 years as the baby boomer generation continues to hit retirement age. So at present, 40 million people in the United States are 65 or older, and this number is projected to double to about 89 million by 2020. And what's interesting is that the oldest old currently represent um, over only about 15% of the population, um, but this is going to rise massively in the next 40 years. Um, so one-fifth of the total population soon will be 65 or older. So that's about where we are now. So this is sort of what we have to look forward to. And this rapid graying is due to the fact that 2011 really marked the year that the baby boom generation began to turn 65. So between January 1st, 2011, when the very first baby boomers turned 65, and December 31st, 2029, when the baby boom generation will sort of stop turning 65, almost 8,000 people are going to be turning 65 each day. And so this amounts to 330 older new older adults every hour. And so this trend has been called the silver tsunami as we're facing these rapidly increasing numbers of older adults. Um, and so just to illustrate this more clearly, here's a, um, this is from 2000 from the Census Bureau. And this is just representing a population pyramid. So a population pyramid is just distributing, showing the distribution of age ranges in particular groups. So we have five-year brackets or chunks on the y-axis. And typically, this graph is supposed to be in the shape of a pyramid. So you see the largest population of people falling at the, at the younger ages, and then that decreases as you get older. And the blue bars are representing men, and the green bars are representing women. And although the largest percentage of individuals here are, are between the ages of 30 and 50, for the most part, this graph is heavily weighted towards younger ages, and then these percentages drop off steadily as you move closer to the older adult group. And you may notice, um, although it's probably hard to see in terms of the, the numbers on the y-axis, but just at the top there, you can see that very few numbers of people are falling between um, over 85, and then even fewer are around 100. <clears throat> 
Um, so here is a projection for the Census Bureau by 2050. And you can see that it shouldn't really be called a population pyramid any, anymore at this point. It really looks like a population dome. And you can see that now there's a large representation of a larger representation of individuals in the older adult um, age groups. And so I don't want to give you the impression that this is merely a national issue. So population aging is really a global phenomenon. So here I just pulled data from eight different countries, and to varying degrees you can see this worldwide trend of aging, with Japan, Japan leading the pack and being extremely elder heavy by 2050, with nearly one-fourth of its population being over the age of 65. So these um, dotted lines that I included indicate where the 65 or older marker is. Um, but then a place like Sudan, while it's showing increasing uh, numbers of older adults, is showing a smaller amount. Um, so you can see that perhaps this term of population pyramid may no longer be accurate by the time we hit uh, 2050. And of course everything I'm showing you is just a projection. And we're all in research and so we constantly are questioning the validity of certain statistics and really the interpretation of averages and forecasts. And so um, I just wanted to show you, or really Considering that the growth rate in the next 40 years will depend on assumptions about future life expectancies, fertility rates, diseases, migration, there are so many factors that would come into these population domes or pyramids that I'm showing you, but even for disbelievers in the group, the lowest projected estimates of projected elderly populations really does lead to a considerable increase starting at about 2010, which is essentially where we are now. So we really can predict that we'll see a lot more older adults in the coming years. And not only will there be many more seniors, but they're living longer. So individual life expectancy is increasing and it's continuing to increase with changes or increases in modern technology and current advances in biotechnology. So again, Japan is leading the pack here, but really all I want you to gather from this graph is that you can expect to live longer. Um, and Stephen Osted, who's a well-respected aging researcher, believes that those individuals who were born in 2000 can expect to live to be at least 150 years old. Um, the longest documented life at this point is 122 years old. That's Jean Carmon. Um, and there's a really funny story about her where when she was 90 years old, she was living in this apartment building and somebody really wanted to buy her apartment for her. So he thought, thinking like, you're 90, you're going to pass away soon, that he would pay her, um, you know, yearly or monthly amount, whatever it was, until, um, until she died and then the apartment would be his. So he was factoring, all right, this woman probably only has a couple years left. I'm going to give her this salary and I'm going to get this apartment for well under market value. Um, it turned out that... Um, she outlived him and she outlived even his children and his wife who were going to hopefully pay for this house and she ended up with way more money than this apartment was worth based on the contract that they had agreed upon because he wasn't expecting her to live for another 30, about 35 years after the point that they had made that agreement. So the implications of this rapid graying global graying have yet to be fully appreciated. So on one hand, increasing numbers of older adults could create opportunity. We could use the talents of older people, um, the elder wisdom. This could be a really great thing. Or it could be a huge burden on society, as you can imagine. So there's no doubt that these changes in age structure can have major societal economic consequences. Um, there'll be fewer working age people to support the older adults. Um, less money for old age assistance programs, and really just if you think about it, the post-war baby boom generation has already put a strain at every phase of life that they've walked through. So the educational system, um, they've strained local hospitals, and so this unexpected age cohort moving through could potentially be a problem. So U.S. population aging in particular has long been predicted um, but in terms of making policy and program decisions, there are lots of characteristics that we'll have to consider for the future. Um, and I argue that one of the most important might be cognitive health or disability of our elders and, and what that means for the policy system. So that brings us to the study of cognitive health in aging. Um, and I say this, but I say that, that cognitive health is really important because even healthy aging, we see cognitive changes that can occur across the lifespan. Um, so if you had to fill in this graph, you might predict um, a change sort of like this, where we're ramping up in our younger adult years, we peak at some point, and then we lose our cognitive function. And in fact, Mark showed you earlier a graph 
where you're seeing just declines in, in sort of every cognitive measure that they're, that they're showing you in this graph. Um, but I think I want to paint a slightly different picture of aging, where it's not only one of decline. And since the story is a lot more complicated, there are really just four critical points that I want you to remember. So the first, I'm gonna discuss each of these in detail on the upcoming slides, but first, systems are gonna age differently. So we may conceive of aging as this period of decline, um, but there are some cognitive functions that are gonna be spared. There are some that are going to improve with life. And the way in which cognitive systems decline or neural systems decline may differ. You have, may, may have some declining rapidly and some declining more slowly. Another important point is that individuals age differently. So I'm sure we can all picture a 90-year-old who's performing really well, playing tennis, uh, could do math in her head, and then a similar 70-year-old who has major cognitive impairments. And so one of the goals in cognitive aging research is to understand this variability. So how is it, we all wanna be like that great 90-year-old, so how can we replicate that? And what are the individual differences that contribute to this? Um, Third, there are many contributing factors, so we'll discuss how um, our education or the diets that we eat can change our cognitive trajectories as we age. And then finally, of course, um, the need for different levels of understanding in terms of aging research. So understanding it both at the molecular level or the cellular level, and then bringing that all the way up to the behavioral or cognitive level. Um, and recent advances in neuroimaging and genetics and computational neuroscience open new avenues for exploring functional relationships between cognitive aging at these different levels, which is pretty exciting. Um, so we can have integration across the behavioral to the molecular level. Okay, so certainly aging is associated with cognitive declines. Um, and some of these could even be more apparent than physical declines, but aging is also associated with cognitive stability, as you can see in this uh, theoretical speculative model of cognitive aging. And also, I just like to put um, pictures of the researchers who've done a lot of the work, because I think it allows us, when we go to conferences, to potentially have a visual trigger of who conducted that research, and it also just reminds us that there are people who are coming up with these ideas. Um, some of the research that I'll be showing you is my own, but you know, this is, this is uh, Ferguson Crake, and this is what he looks like, and when you go to a conference and you see him, th then you'll know what he, he um, works on. But so again, I just wanna point out here that I'm talking about healthy aging, and um, these declines would be more uh, apparent in pathological aging. But there are really these two distinct patterns of age trends, um, with a monotonic decrease in, um, in reasoning and other processes, um, process abilities, and then we see stability, maybe followed by a decline, decline at later life for acquired knowledge. So in other words, representations um, or well-learned skills such as playing the piano might uh, be spared or maintained with healthy aging, whereas uh, control processes would generally decline. And then consistent with this view, here is data from actual older adults. And we can see that world knowledge is um, preserved over age. So those are the red and yellow lines. Um, but we do see performance declines with increasing age for things like speed of processing, working memory, long-term memory. Any questions? Okay. Now point two is that people age differently. So the graph on the left is showing processing speed data on the y-axis with age on the x-axis, and each dot is reflecting an individual subject. And then on the right graph, we're looking at neural data. So this is um, volume of the entorhinal cortex. The x-axis is showing us, again, age. And now these barbells are representing one individual taken at two different time points, separated by about five years. And from these graphs, you can see that some younger adult participants perform just like older adult participants. Some of the older adult per per participants are performing just like the younger adult participants. And then when we look at the graph on the right, you can see that there are various changes even among an individual. So some individuals in their 50s are maintaining entorhinal cortex volume, some are improving entorhinal cortex volume, and some show declines. Um, so there really isn't one consistent pattern, although we can take averages, but we really need to take note of these individual differences. Okay, point three is that there are many factors that contribute to how we age. So depending on our genotype, whether we exercise, whether we smoke, our cultural background, the time of day, whether we're drinking uh, caffeine, our cognition and our subsequent age-related decline are influenced. Um, and these factors will likely contribute to those individual differences that I just pointed out to you. 
Um, and some of these factors are permanent, so we can't change our genetics or our neurobiology, but some of these factors might be more situational where the time of day that we're tested may influence um, our cognitive output, for example. Um, so this figure is just showing several factors that indicate whether our aging might lead to be more successful or show dementia or decline. And this list isn't meant to be comprehensive at all, but just merely summarizes some factors of recent interest. So for example, having a genetic risk factor like APOE, which is a gene that's supposed to be uh, or thought to be associated with the onset of Alzheimer's disease, or having uh, hypertension, brain atrophy, depression, this may lead to cognitive decline. Whereas somebody with um, favorable longevity genes, somebody who participates in cardiovascular exercise or in cognitive training programs uh, might be someone who would show more successful aging. And so moving into our next point, this process of integrating data across these different levels and theories provides us with opportunities to really understand the bigger picture of how somebody might age in a more healthy way versus a less successful way. And it allows for cross-level hypothesis generation and hypothesis testing. So this brings us to the last and fourth point, that there are many levels of understanding. And this is obviously true in any, in any work. Um, and so at the behavioral level, some questions that you might ask would look at intra-individual variability um, and de-differentiation of abilities, whereas you have the information processing level. Experimental researchers have proposed that general processing resources like working memory or attentional capacity or processing speed might explain why we see age differences that would be present at the behavioral level. And then finally, you could have the neurobiological level where neuroscientists are studying uh, neuroanatomical, metabolic, neurochemical changes. Um, so losses in synaptic connections or in structural losses or in white matter integrity. And some researchers would hypothesize that it's these changes that would then lead to changes you would see at the information processing level, so declines in working memory, that then would cause these beha uh, behavioral level changes of individual differences. So it's really important to really integrate these uh, different models together. And to really highlight why many levels of understanding is important, I want you to consider David Snowden's Nun study. I, I'm not sure if you have ever come across this work. Um, it was more popular a couple years back. Um, but he wanted to examine about 700 sisters. And he used this population because he could investigate their personal and research histories, but they also lived a very similar lifestyle. So they're eating the same foods. They're abiding to the same schedules. It's a really interesting population because you have a lot of controls taken for, um, into account. So you could get a sense of how biology might contribute versus lifestyle here. And this study revealed that there can be a mismatch on occasion, not always, but on occasion, where age-related neurobiological changes and changes observed at the behavioral level um, are not necessarily the same. So Snowden found that some sisters suffered from progressive losses in the brain. They might have um, uh, abnormal brain weight. They would have plaques and tangles riddling their brain. And in these... Uh, they ha would have a genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's, and they, when doctors looked at their brain, they would say, oh, this is absolutely a brain that had Alzheimer's. And yet, cognitive evaluations prior to death for these women were completely normal. You would never know that they had brains riddled with Alzheimer's pa pathology. And then on the other hand, you could have a woman with normal brain weight, uh, very few plaques and tangles, and yet you might have given them a clinical diagnosis of probable Alzheimer's before they passed away because they were showing very poor social skills, very poor cognitive skills. And so this really shows that there needs to be a balance between these different levels of research because if we were to make diagnoses of Alzheimer's just based on looking at someone's brain, it, would, it could really lead to some sort of learned helplessness or um, some sort of impairments that may not exist otherwise, having not known that your brain is riddled um, with the disease. So speaking of brain changes, let's just talk a little bit about brain changes that accompany aging. So here I'm just showing you some gross changes in the brain in younger versus older adults. Um, and you can see that there are just and observing this, you can see that there's some reduction in, um, in the cortices and uh, the general thinning of the cortical regions as well as enlarged ventricles. Um, but specifically, I'm going to be talking about dopaminergic changes and then also changes that we see in the striatum and the medial temporal lobes. So starting with uh, the dopamine hypothesis of aging, 
Recent evidence is suggesting that the cognitive deficits that occur in normal aging are likely due to neurochemical shifts. And the dopaminergic system is a particularly promising neural, neural chemical correlate of cognitive aging. And this is because dopamine transporter binding and uh, content mechanisms in various brain regions seem to decline with aging. And then there's also direct experimental evidence that connects dopaminergic function or deficient dopamine function to cognitive declines. Um, so declines in dopamine availability is what's thought to account for at least some or many of the cognitive impairments that you see with healthy aging. Um, so as an example, reduced dopamine density in older rats in their uh, striatum is associated with decreased response speed. And also there have been drugs that have been used to facilitate dopaminergic modulation of the, so, so for example, D1 agonists. Um, and this has been found to alleviate memory deficits in aged monkeys. Um, and this is in aged monkeys who are showing naturally occurring dopamine declines. And then the same thing, in humans we're seeing connections between attenuation of striatal D2 receptor binding mechanisms and age differences in things like processing speed and episodic memory. So this is really just to give you a sense of the different studies that have been done in terms of neurochemistry, looking at uh, the dopamine transporter, the D1, the D2 receptors. And to give you a very gross picture, um, there's an approximate 10% decline in, in the dopamine transporters, the D2 and D1 receptors with each passing decade. And this starts in your early 20s, so we're not off the hook at, at our age even. Um, and there's evidence of dopamine receptor loss in various extrastriatal regions as well. The anterior cingulate is thought to show a 13% decline. The frontal cortex, the hippocampus, the amygdala, we're seeing this throughout the brain. It's not necessarily targeted in just the striatum. Um, so the first figure I'm showing you here, and this is from Moore et al., this shows a loss of dopaminergic activity um, in the caudate, and, and this is using PET. So the left image is from a 25-year-old younger adult. The right image is from an older adult. And you can just see, without even knowing uh, what we're looking at here, which happens to be the dopamine transporter, um, that we can see, or rather that's the D2 binding on top, we can see that there are gross differences between the younger and older brain. And the same thing on the bottom, looking at both the caudate and the putamen, and this is now looking at DAT binding. Then on the right, we're looking at um, the Van Dyke study is looking at dopamine transporter availability and age. We can see that's declining in both the caudate and the putamen. And then the Wang study investigated D1 receptors again by age, and we can see declines. And of note, the Van Dyke study also examined the relationship between this DAT availability and age-related deficits in episodic memory and executive functioning. And he found that age-related cognitive deficits were mediated by these reductions in DAT1 binding. So this can suggest that DAT is a powerful mediator of age-related cognitive changes and really in, in general cognitive functioning as well, because we did see these relationships even in younger adults. What's been most interesting to me recently is that aging is obviously one of the strongest risk factors for Parkinson's disease. And by inference, this suggests that changes in nigrostriatal dopamine neurons during normal aging might contribute to the neuropathogenesis of Parkinson's disease. So in fact, a recent study had demonstrated that neuronal damage to the dopaminergic cells themselves in the substantia nigra um, in individuals older than 70 years of age actually looked almost exactly like Parkinson's patients. And so an increasing number of commonalities ranging from the molecular level to the functional level have identified changes in the dopamine neurons that occur in both normal aging and in Parkinson's disease. So this is just, I mean, you don't need to pay attention to the details here, but you can see that there are a lot of commonalities between healthy normal aging and Parkinson's disease. So a recent hypothesis put forth in 2011 in a Nature Review's neuroscience article proposed that the cellular mechanisms underlying vulnerability to decreased dopamine um, is fundamentally the same in healthy aging and in Parkinson's disease. In other words, these age-related changes that we're seeing in the dopamine system are the biological foundation for Parkinson's disease. Um, and Cellular changes, of course, exist across a continuum. 
So aging might produce a vulnerability to be in a pre-Parkinsonian state, and then this would be exaggerated or accelerated by a combination of genetic factors or environmental factors that could really differ an individual between being somebody who's a healthy elder versus somebody who has the Parkinson's disease phenotype. Um, but I still think that it's interesting to use Parkinson's disease and aging as models for each other. Um, and so we can investigate what these age-related losses in dopamine might mean for cognition. So it's been suggested that age-related learning impairments are the result of simultaneous dopamine dysregulation that comes with age. And so if this dopamine hypothesis of aging is valid, you would expect to see commonalities in behavioral output or in cognition between healthy elders and Parkinson's disease patients. And this would assume that the low dopamine that you see in Parkinson's and not other disease-related factors are driving those differences that you see in cognition. So to examine this possibility, I want to show you uh, the probabilistic selection task. So this is a task that has two different phases in it starting with an acquisition phase and then a post-acquisition test phase. And in the acquisition phase, subjects are presented with three different stimulus pairs. And the task actually uses hieragonic characters, but just for simplicity of the example, um, the pairs that they would see would be A, B, C, D, and E, F. And feedback follows the participant's choice. They have to choose which stimulus is correct, but this feedback is probabilistic. So as an example, in A-B pairs, a choice of stimulus A would lead to positive feedback 80% of the time, whereas the choice of B would be in reinforced on 20% of the trial. So you can see here, a participant would see these, to have a choice of hieragonic characters. They might select one. They would get a response that they were correct. Later on, they would come across the same pair. They might choose that same stimulus, but now they would be told they're incorrect. So this would be a probabilistic design. And essentially, um, learning the most frequently rewarded stimulus can be done in two different ways. First, you could be learning that the stimulus on the left is correct, or you could be learning to avoid the other stimulus. So you're learning that, the, that the, um, the stimulus on the right is one that is incorrect and should be avoided. You could also learn both. You could learn that one is correct and one is incorrect. But essentially, there's a post-acquisition test phase to really understand whether individuals were learning from positive feedback or negative feedback. And so we see, have participants seeing um, some of those pairs that they saw before, so the A, B, C, D, and E, F, those would be the trained pairs to evaluate retention. But now we would look at every novel combination of stimulus pairs together. And what's of most interest to us is those pairs that contain an A, which was the most rewarded stimulus, versus those pairs that contain a B, which was the least rewarded stimulus. And the idea being that if a participant had focused, let's say, on the A, and that A was correct during training, they then would be accurate on all the pairs where they saw the A. They would know A is correct, and they would get very high accuracy on these pairs. But then they might not have focused on the B in that pair, and suddenly when they're presented with novel B pairings, they don't really know how to perform. And so their accuracy might be just at chance. Whereas in contrast, somebody who knew that B was wrong and to avoid B would be accurate on all the pairs that involved a B in that they would choose C, D, E, and F, but then perhaps when they saw the A pairs, they didn't focus on those and would only perform at chance there. So is this task clear, essentially this dissociation between positive and negative feedback? Okay, great. So Michael Frank did a study in 2004, and he investigated Parkinson's patients both on and off their medication. And as we can see by the graph, this is just looking at test. So Parkinson's patients who have depleted levels of dopamine, and that's shown in red, demonstrated a greater tendency to avoid those decisions that led to uh, negative consequences than they were to seek positive outcomes. So they showed a negative um, a bias towards learning from negative outcomes. And this pattern was reversed when Parkinson's patients took their medication, thereby elevating their dopamine levels, shown in green, and these individuals are now more sensitive to the positive versus the negative feedback. Um, so this is consistent with previous work suggesting that dopamine modulates probabilistic learning. I'm sure you've covered this earlier in the, in the semester. Um, so now we compare these Parkinson's disease data to what we see in aging. So again, we're looking at this choose A versus avoid B bias. So the choose A would be positive learning, the, the avoid B bias would be negative learning. And here we can see that college age adults are showing a bias towards positive feedback learning, which would be consistent with elevated levels of dopamine. And then when we look at older adults, we're seeing sort of a balance between their performance or preference to learn from positive or negative feedback. And 
So you can see that this was my own work. This was uh, some of the work that I had done in graduate school. And one thing that really interested me was in some ways I looked at this data and I thought, well, maybe the older adults are performing better than the younger adults because they're more balanced in their ability to learn. They can learn from both positive and negative feedback, whereas younger adults really have a preferential bias towards positive feedback. Alternatively, it could be that we're seeing this swing of the pendulum where you're learning more from positive feedback and as you're learning dopamine, eventually you're gonna be learning more from negative feedback. And as it turns out, as I was working on this study, uh, Michael Frank had come out with an additional study where he examined younger older adults versus older older adults. And you can see that as younger seniors, which age group actually was identical to what I had studied, showed this similar pattern of a more biased preference, so uh, or less biased preference, um, learning equally well from positive and negative feedback. But then as older adults got older and, and presumably lost more dopamine, you're seeing um, a preference towards negative feedback that really mirrors what we see in Parkinson's disease. We can see a lot of overlap um, between the two conditions and um, that supports Collier's hypothesis from 2011 that we can see a lot of commonalities, at least even at the behavioral level for Parkinson's disease and, and healthy aging. Any questions? All right. So switching gears slightly, I now want to talk about the differential aging of the medial temporal lobes and the striatum. And what I speak about moving forward should remind us of the point that I made earlier, that our systems are aging differently, um, and that we don't necessarily see the same trajectory of decline in every brain region. Um, so we'll talk about how, how we can see some differences in medial temporal lobe and striatal function with healthy lifespan. And just to tie it back to dopamine for a second here, you can see that the D1 binding potential measurements show no age group differences in the medial temporal lobe, but that's the only region of interest that was selected by this research group. Um, we see strong age effects across all the other regions that were, that were selected. So we can see striatal regions, um, frontal regions, the anterior cingulate, the parietal cortex. Each of these are, are showing declines with aging that are not seen in the medial temporal lobes. Now, this is interesting, but it could, it should be, this finding should be treated with caution given that there's a positive of D1 receptors in the medial temporal lobe. So it may just be a poor measurement reliability that we're seeing here. But this does mirror some, some literature, some exotic literature that shows similar patterns with the D2 receptor losses in the striatal limbic and cortical regions. This finding is also interesting because it fits historically with data that compares healthy elders to patient populations. Um, so this includes frontal lobe patients, Parkinson's disease patients, Alzheimer's patients, and those with uh, medial temporal lobe amnesia. So frontal lobe patients really show an augmented fashion of many of the cognitive deficits that you see in healthy aging. So this would be issues with recall, with uh, context memory, with working memory, executive function deficits. Um, and likewise, as I already mentioned, Parkinson's disease patients show cognitive deficits um, that really resemble healthy aging, as we just discussed. In contrast, cognitive deficits in MTL amnesics and in Alzheimer's patients seem to differ from what we see in healthy aging. So um, Alzheimer's patients and, and amnesics show severe episodic deficits in both strategic and associative memory tasks but healthy older adults are usually um, less impaired in these areas. Um, we can still see recognition memory, for example, in these individuals. And so this is what initially led to this hypothesis that maybe striatal dysfunction may play a more important role in age-related cognitive change than MTL dysfunction. And so building on that, studies have shown robust morphological and neurochemical, but we've already discussed the neurochemical, um, but robust morphological changes in the caudate with age relative to the hippocampus. And I'm referring to the caudate and the hippocampus, but really I'm speaking to the striatum and the MTL in general. So this graph on the right here is revealing bilateral age-related shrinkage in the volume of the caudate. Um, in contrast, there's a lot of structural evidence that shows preserved hippocampal volume with age, which suggests that hippocampal atrophy may only be associated with uh, pathology or hypertension or advanced old age, but not necessarily healthy aging per se. Um, and so more recent work has actually shown that perhaps in, in the later stages of aging, so as you're approaching 70, 75 years of age, you might see an amplified um, 
accelerated trajectory of losses in the hippocampus, but it's really not until those later stages of aging that you're seeing this decline. So there's relative sparing in the MTL volume, including the parahippocampal and enterinal cortices that you're not seeing in the striatum, so in either the caudate or the putamen. And just to be clear, these, ha these changes are happening in gray matter and in white matter as well. So this study is showing age group differences in the white matter connections between the bilateral caudate and prefrontal tracts, but they're not showing age differences between younger and older adults in the hippocampal to dorsolateral prefrontal tracts. And this is consistent with the claim that the age-related changes are greater in the striatum than they are in the MTL. And so one question that I had was, well, what does this mean for cognition? If we're seeing relative sparing in one neural region uh, that's not present in the other, what might this mean? And so I chose this cartoon um, because we'll be looking at associative learning, but what I think is interesting here is we have Superman who's all suited up, ready to go. So this suggests that his striatal habit um, cognition is still intact and that he knew what clothes to put on, he knew where to go, but that ultimately he couldn't remember where he was going. So this cartoon is essentially, to me at least, suggesting a deficit in, um, in the hippocampus but not in the, in the caudate when in fact I actually think that uh, the story might be a little different from that. Um, so associative learning interests me because it calls on these two neural learning systems, one that's based on the MTL, one that's based on the striatum, each of which can contribute to learning, and the idea is that their relative involvement depends on the nature of the task, the level of training, the conditions under which you're tested. Um, and so given that these, these brain regions show differential aging, I was curious to see how that might expand to cognition. So I'll be showing you data from three different um, tasks, essentially, that touch upon these uh, brain regions. We'll start with sequence versus context learning. So sequence learning and spatial context learning are important um, because one type shows decline in aging and one does not. So implicit sequence learning is really just looking at regularities across time. Um, so learning regularities from a series of events over time, and this would be a skill that would be important for something like learning languages. Whereas spatial context learning refers to learning of spatial layouts. And this would be how to locate an object in a room or maybe a friend in a crowded environment. The best example that I can think of is locating Waldo in, in an Aware's Waldo scheme. And so starting with sequence learning, um, are you guys familiar with, this, with the sequence learning task? Have you covered that this semester? Just in brief, essentially, participants are looking at four dots presented horizontally on a computer screen and when a light fills in, a participant would just have to make a corresponding key press. And essentially, the stimuli are presented either in a repeating pattern or they're presented randomly. And the idea is that when stimuli are presented in a repeating pattern, you respond faster and more accurately than you would when the stimuli are presented randomly. And so here, I'm showing you some data. Um, it might be a little challenging to see this here, but essentially, here we have, most importantly, healthy controls. So you can see that their reaction time is decreasing in response to the uh, repeating stimuli, but then when we do a block of random stimuli, there we see a big change in reaction time performance. And um, this is another patient group here, but more importantly, this is the Parkinson's disease data, and you can see that there's no, no difference between the repeating stimuli and the random stimuli. And so this suggests that the striatum is involved in this type of learning. And then when we look at healthy controls, we also see using PET imaging data um, that healthy normal subjects reveal activation in both their caudate and their, and their putamen during this type of learning. In contrast, we have the contextual cueing task. So here, participants are viewing arrays that contain distractors and a target. So all participants have to do is locate a horizontal letter T. So I don't know if you guys can see it so clearly, but here would be the horizontal letter T, and they just have to make a key press whether the T is facing left or right. And essentially, this T is presented among um, essentially L's or offset T's. Um, and the spatial layout of this configuration can predict where the location of the T is. But this is only true for some configurations. So some configurations repeat and predict the location of that target, whereas others are novel and random at each time and therefore make it less, uh, um, responding would be slower to those unfamiliar arrays. And so here we have data from a control group and an amnesic group. And really what we're looking at is uh, the separation and responding. So we're looking at faster responses to familiar than to novel. 
and that's what we're seeing in this control group, but we're seeing no difference in performance between these two types of arrays in the amnesia group. So this is suggesting that the MTL is involved in this type of learning, and then of course follow-up work using neuroimaging also suggested that the hippocampus is involved in this type of learning, or really the MTL in general. Um, and so here we are looking at now data that these were conducted by my advisors in grad school. Um, we can see that there are impairments in the sequence learning task where younger adults are outperforming older adults in the striatal based learning task, but we see age constancy in this MTL based task, uh, the spatial contextual learning task. So this is beginning evidence that we see we can see. Uh, changes in the striatum might lead to cognitive output changes, whereas the relative sparing of the hippocampus might lead to age constancy and performance in MTL-based cognition. Do you have a question? No? OK. All right, so moving along, here is some data from my dissertation that's examining this similar topic. So research from young adults, from patients, and animals suggests that initial learning might involve the hippocampus for the formation of new stimulus representations in a probabilistic learning task, but that with practice or with habit, um, the stridum comes online. And this is due to gradual integration of complex associations over time. And so here's a brief outline of the task that I've used. It's, it actually is a form of a sequence learning task, although this is a probabilistic learning task. But essentially, participants are presented with a predictive cue and this cue predicts a location of a subsequent target. So next they would have a random cue, and this can occur in any location, it doesn't matter at all, but the location of that first red cue now predicts that the green target will occur in the second location. But this is only true 80% of the time. In the remaining set of the cases, um, a, a red cue in the third location would predict a green light in either the first third or fourth locations. These would be low probability trials. And essentially, you're just comparing the accuracy on high to low probability trials over the course of learning. Um, so I mentioned that early learning is dependent on the hippocampus or the MTL, and later learning seems to involve the caudate. Here we have a measure of learning on the y-axis with younger adults in black, older adults in white, and you can see that there's age constancy early in training, but then as we move to later training, you can see these major age deficits where older adults seem to plateau and younger adults continue to improve. And this mirrors the data that I just showed you before with the sequence learning. Um, and in fact, we've tested this um, where participants were tested over 10 days, which is a ridiculous amount of training. Um, but essentially, the older adults were never able to catch up. So it wasn't just that they needed more time. Um, the younger adults just continue to improve, and the older adults are plateauing. Um, now, I may not have convinced you at this point, because we're just looking at behavioral data. So I wanted to run a neuroimaging study to support my claims and essentially look at the brain activation in early, in early training versus later training to see if this might explain the behavioral deficits that we're seeing. Um, so we ran a follow-up neuroimaging study. And early in learning, we saw equivalent performance between our younger and older adults. And as we predicted, we saw um, similar activation in younger and older adults in the hippocampus. Then when we looked at the, this is just the response of the bilateral hippocampus in a graphical figure, but we can see that the output at the hippocampus is nearly identical for younger and older adults. So we're not seeing any differences in learning, and we're not seeing any differences in hippocampal activation. But when we look at later learning, we can see that younger adults are showing activations in their caudate, and for older adults, it was completely quiet. And when we look at the connection between the extent of or excuse me, caudate activation, now we can see that there's a positive relationship between learning and caudate activation in younger adults that's not present at all in older adults. So we're not seeing any relationship. And so this is suggesting that MTL is leading to spared cognition and that the age-related deficits that we're seeing in the strata may lead to uh, age-related impairments. And here in my postdoc, um, I have now been using the acquired equivalence task um, to look at these same ideas. And I'm assuming maybe you guys have covered that this semester. In brief, many of you are in the Gluck Lab, so <laughs> you've probably seen this, but let's at least cover it briefly. So participants are simply to learn a simple association at the beginning of the task where they're pairing a face with a fish. 
In the next stage of the task, they're learning that two distinct faces are all associated with the same fish. So in this case, the brunette and the blonde woman both prefer the blue fish over the green fish. And then in a final stage of training, participants are seeing everything that they saw before, but now they're learning that the brunette-haired uh, girl also likes the red fish. And so finally, the, there's a generalization, oh, and this is all learned via feedback, so you're getting feedback training. Then there's a test phase that includes no feedback, and essentially you're presented with this new premise, which is which fish does this blonde-haired woman prefer? You've never seen this before. But essentially, if you've created an equivalence between these two individuals at a second stage of training, you would, you would be able to predict that this blonde woman would also prefer the red fish. And so evidence shows that this, the, the caudate is involved in the learning phase of the task, whereas the hippocampus is involved in the uh, generalization phase of the task. And essentially, when we look at uh, the behavioral performance, we can see that there are age-related changes in the caudate with age. Um, where younger adults are performing better than middle-aged adults who are performing better than older adults, consistent with the idea that we're seeing uh, linear changes in the caudate. Um, but when we look at the hippocampal-based function or generalization, younger and middle-aged adults are performing equivalently, and it's just in older adults who are older than the age of 70 who are showing declines, and this is consistent with that newer research I showed you that showed accelerated declines in the hippocampus later with age. Any questions? I'm realizing we're sort of running out of time, so um, essentially I just want to cover quickly, um, my current research has been looking at potential genetic influences in uh, healthy aging and whether that can contribute to individual differences that we're seeing. Um, so essentially I think this research is pretty interesting because it could take into account, looking at the previous tasks that we've done, um, the individual differences, so how genotype might contribute to learning, that systems age differently, so looking at the differences between an MTL and striatal-based function, and then also this idea of many levels of understanding where you're joining together biological factors with cognitive factors to see um, impairments in aging. And so there are many different models, theoretical models, of how age might influence learning. On one hand, genotypic differences between um, carriers of a disadvantageous variant versus non-carriers might be present at an early age um, and remain constant throughout aging. Another idea is that there may be differences between these genotypes early in aging that then become less pronounced with aging, or of course, that genotypic differences are not present early in aging and then are magnified either linearly or with some sort of um, abrupt change for something like menopause or retirement. And um, the most supported model is called the resource modulation hypothesis. And this posits that healthy aging amplifies the effects of genetic variation on cognition. So this is taking the idea that there's a well-characterized inverted U-shaped function linking brain resources to cognitive performance. And so younger adults have more optimal cognitive function, they're, they're performing at the peak, and so there's really only a small difference in performance between carriers of a disadvantageous variant versus those of uh, um, non-carriers. But as brain resources are, are lost, a constant difference, so this difference here is constant between the younger and older adults, but now we see a more pronounced difference between carriers of the disadvantageous allele against those with the more advantageous allele. Um, is that theory clear? Because I know that this is now, I'm speeding through sort of more complex material here. Um, but essentially, long story short, constant amounts of genetic variation in young adulthood and older adulthood um, essentially would lead to greater performance declines in older adults than in younger adults due to losses in brain resources. And so two genes of interest to me would be the DAT1 gene that's associated with striatal function and BDNF that would be associated with hippocampal function and using these genes to sort of explore the same types of questions that I had just shown you earlier with the experiments that I had done earlier. Um, so who, here are two recent studies that have addressed these research questions. Both of these have been done by Su Chen Li in Germany. And here we can see, this is a more complicated study. She was looking at the uh, serial um, position curve, but essentially, and essentially looking at the interaction between the D2 genotype and the DAT genotype. So carriers of uh, NEC, or um, 
rather, let me, let me go backwards. This is the proportion correct that we're looking at. So we can see that individuals who are 9-9 homozygotes who have the most levels of dopamine, when that's combined with the most levels of dopamine from the DRD2 gene, we see that there are large differences in older adults that are not present in younger adults. So this amplified difference in older versus younger adults. And the same thing is true when we look at BDNF in that we can see um, there are not many differences between the val allele and the met allele in younger adults, so hardly any difference in the primacy, middle, or recency effect looking at um, backward digit recall. But we see larger differences now when we look at these effects in older adults. So the more complicated a task, the more pronounced this difference becomes. And we can see these genotypic effects in older adults that may not be present in younger adults. Um, and so now looking at data from the acquired equivalence task, the DAT1 data and learning is still pending. And I don't know why the graph shows up this way. Um, but essentially, you, if you can see, despite this big black box that's preventing you from seeing it, um, that there's little cognitive difference in between val val homozygotes and met carriers in younger adults that then becomes more pronounced in older adults. Um, so just wrapping up, um, I'm hopeful that some of these contributions of my research can contribute to the understanding of how and why cognitive and neural function change with uh, age. And my hope is that educational programs could be created that account for those spared capacities of older adults, um, but also compensate for those that have declined so that each of us could enjoy these long, cognitively rich lives of Ruth Hamilton, Gertrude Baines, and Jean Camon. And so just to cover what, just to give you some key ideas of what we covered today, the significance of rapid population aging has yet to be fully appreciated. Um, a major point that I want you to take home is that aging is not a cookie cutter process, that systems and people age differently and there are many factors that contribute to these differences. Dopamine obviously plays an important neuromodulatory function in age-graded changes in cognition across the lifespan. There are task or process dependent patterns of age differences in associative learning that appear to reflect differential aging of the MTL and striatum, and we could probably see this across a wide host of tasks. And then finally, emerging research on lifespan cognitive neurogenetics shows that aging related declines in brain phenotypes, meaning dopamine function or BDNF availability, could alter relationships between genotype and behavioral phenotypes. So essentially, whether we see differences between genotypes um, in certain learning tasks. And that's all I have for you.